Okay, <laughs> try that again. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Today, we're doing a deep dive of the International Dimensions chapter of the National Issues Report. Today's event is the second of four webinars that make up our winter webinar series. My name is Fiona Warren, and I'll be the moderator today. I'm the Knowledge Assessment Manager at Natural Resources Canada within the Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation Division, where we lead Canada's national assessment process. Claire Sanders at the Climate Risk Institute will be available during the webinar if you run into any audio or technical issues. To ask her a question, open the chat box and using the drop down arrow, locate Claire Sanders and you can send her a private message. Please note that your microphones have been muted to avoid any audio distractions or feedback during the webinar. There will be a dedicated Q&A session at the end of the webinar, but that doesn't mean you have to hold your questions until then. Please feel free to type out your questions during the presentations in the Q&A box. Les présentations seront en anglais, mais vous pouvez poser des questions dans anglais ou français. Aussi, les présentations sont disponibles dans les deux langues sur notre site du web. We are recording the webinar today, and we'll be sending out the link to everyone who has registered, along with a copy of the presentation slides. As a virtual event, we are gathered today across the traditional and unceded territories of many Indigenous peoples. On behalf of those of us in the National Capital Region, I acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. I invite you to use the chat to enter your own land acknowledgement from wherever you are today, if you wish. So on to the report now. The National Issues Report was released in June and it focuses on climate change impacts and adaptation issues that are of national importance or that are best understood through an integrated pan-Canadian perspective. It clearly demonstrates that climate change is already affecting many aspects of our lives, that the impacts will persist and in most cases intensify, and that more action is urgently needed on adaptation. Like all of our reports, it is available at our website, changingclimate.ca. Today's webinar will focus on the International Dimensions chapter. This chapter examines how climate change is affecting connections between Canada and the rest of the world, such as trade, transboundary issues, and human migration. I'm very pleased to welcome today's speakers, two authors of the chapter. First, I would like to introduce Jimena Ezeguar, who is the coordinating lead author of the chapter. Jimena is the International Team Director and Practice Lead for Climate Change Adaptation at ESSEC Technologies Limited. She has over 15 years of experience in policy relevant research and analysis to advance climate change adaptation at different scales. She has a breadth of Canadian and developing country experience in program design, policy analysis, vulnerability and risk assessment, knowledge synthesis, and monitoring and evaluation. She also chairs the expert, the Adaptation Expert Panel of the Canadian Institute for Climate Traces. Welcome, Jimena. Our second speaker today is Robert McLennan. Robert is the Professor of Geography and Environmental Studies at Wilfrid Laurier University. His research and teaching have a heavy focus on climate change impacts and adaptation. A former Canadian Foreign Service Officer, Dr. McLennan has published extensively on the impacts of environmental change on livelihoods and migration patterns. He is also a coordinating lead author for the soon to be released Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Working Group 2 Sixth Assessment Report. So on behalf of everyone joining us today, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Jimena and Robert for presenting the webinar and a welcome to everyone today who's joining us. It's much appreciated. So without further ado, I will now turn things over to Jimena. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you, Fiona. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Fiona mentioned, my name is Jimena Ziere and I coordinated coordinated and led the development of this chapter. Um, in the next 40 minutes or so, my colleague Robert McClemon and I will present a few of the key findings that emerged from our assessment work. Uh, as you can see from this slide, um, the, our part of the presentation will have three main parts. Uh, first, I'll introduce the chapter, then we'll jump into the main part of the presentation, which is a focus on three of the five key uh, messages. And then I'll end our presentation with some thoughts on emerging issues and knowledge gaps that uh, we thought about kind of um, stepping back from the messages emerging from the different themes that we touched on. We'll make sure to leave some time for Q's and A's, and then we'll pass it back to Fiona, um, who will talk about the webinar series. Next slide, please. <laughs> 
Of course, pulling together an assessment chapter requires substantial team effort. And so I just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge the contributions of the full author team. Uh, today, as I mentioned, you will only be hearing from me and Robert, but the team comprised a range of individuals with varied experience and expertise. And I'm very grateful that they went along on this journey with me that took um, quite a long time. <laughs> Next slide, please. So why is this chapter in the National Issues volume of Canada in a changing climate? Uh, as our experience with the global pandemic has made abundantly clear, what happens outside of Canada affects us, and what happens within our borders can shape events and, events and trends elsewhere as well. Therefore, as, Theo, as Fiona mentioned, with this chapter, we assess how climate change is affecting the connections between Canada and the rest of the world, both the risks and opportunities from indirect climate change impacts and from actions taken to manage them. These indirect impacts of climate change with international dimensions don't often get included in national assessments in Canada or elsewhere, really, even though we are living in a globalized, hyper interconnected world. And Canada as well has a number of obligations to meet even as the climate changes. So I'm really glad that we are able to take the time and investment to pull together this chapter. Next slide, please. Not to make assumptions, but I bet some of you looked at the chapter and thought, how in the world did folks come up with these five themes to focus on? Uh, that would be a great question because the scope of international dimensions of climate change and adaptation is vast. It includes impacts across neighboring countries like conflicts over water sharing agreements, effects spread through linkages over large distances like trade routes, and cascading effects where an event in one or several locations generates a myriad of impacts and responses to those impacts, like humanitarian crises and related policy responses. This conceptual framework that you see on the right hand of the slide, which looks very, very tiny from where I'm looking, uh, but hopefully you can blow it up here, uh, illustrates these points of the different kind of transmission mechanisms and would have indeed been very useful to have as we scope this chapter. Nevertheless, we selected themes that illustrated a range of transmission mechanisms, scale of impact, and ways we could adapt. We came to these scoping decisions through, one, looking at how international dimensions had been covered in previous Canadian climate change impacts and adaptation assessments, the one in 2008 and to the one in 2014 in particular. Uh, we did a rapid literature scan to get a sense of what scholarship practice and policy developments were available to build on. And then we did some consultation with the international development community and observation of how other communities like defense were addressing these issues or not. Next slide, please. This is also very tiny, so maybe you can enlarge it, but um, so the di this diagram is also in the chapter itself, um, by the way. The diagram on this slide illustrates some of the indirect climate change impacts for Canada and related policy responses. So starting from the top, all over the world today and into the future, climate stressors, both gradual and event-based or acute, are combining with non-climate factors like the structure of economies, consumer preferences, to produce changes in the flows, quality, abundance, or distribution of societal functions. These are the things in turquoise or chartreuse in the middle kind of layer. Depending on capacities and sensitivities to the changes and what specific connections Canada has, we can experience a number of impacts. If they are persistent and consequential enough, these indirect impacts demand policy responses and actions at other levels, at the household level, within companies, et cetera. And of course, and this is what's represented at the bottom layer in blue. And of course, I have shown the impact chain to suggest that the flow is from kind of the outside in. But as I mentioned earlier, direct impacts in Canada can have effects elsewhere, too. Next slide, please. Right. Here are the five key messages that emerge from our assessment. So on the next few slides, we will go over some details underlying key messages on trade, population displacement and migration, and international development assistance. These are key messages three, four, and five. Next slide, please. 
The first key message, climate change presents risks and opportunities for international trade. As a mixed economy, Canada is dependent on international trade for economic reasons and to satisfy the needs and wants of citizens. As you may know, over half our national gross domestic product or GDP comes from the import and export of goods and services in the global marketplace. Indeed, we rely on foreign supplies of goods, final goods and intermediate goods like car parts and for foreigners to buy our products. Because of this dependence on international trade, as climate change intensifies, we will increasingly experience economic effects from extreme weather and climate change impacts and adaptation elsewhere in the world, especially when these shocks and stressors occur in countries with which Canada has strong trade ties, like the US, China, Japan, Mexico, and the UK. One mechanism of risk is through disruptions in supply chains and distribution networks because of vulnerabilities in trade infrastructure. As highlighted in the slide, a lot of cargo is moved through marine shipping and seaport operations, which is in turn connect, generally connected to inland rail and road networks. In Canada, Port Metro Vancouver alone handles about 17% of trade by volume. Floods and mudslides just last year illustrated the importance of linked infrastructure systems in getting and receiving goods from global markets. Global trade of food staples, commodities like wheat and fertilizers may be particularly susceptible to breakdowns in trade infrastructure and routes because we are over-reliant in general on a few marine, sorry, maritime, coastal and inland choke points or narrow passages that connect to large areas. Next slide, please. Now, short-term disruptions to supply routes and distribution networks due to climate damages to trade infrastructure have economic impacts, and it is certain that we will face these disruptions in the years to come. We just don't know when, where, and what the magnitude of the effect could be. Sometimes we don't, or maybe even the direction of the effect. Studies that model the effects of climate-induced disruptions to trade transport are few. And there are many uncertainties, including the resilience of trade infrastructure to climate change, the viability of new shipping lanes, including the Northwest Passage, and whether operators, such as port operators, assess and manage climate change risk. Some studies suggest that the more concerning climate change risk related to trade are shifts in the availability and prices of basic goods through climate-induced disruptions to production. Food and feedstock Timber, metals are among the basic goods referred to in the literature. Vulnerabilities on the supply side include exposure to climate change impacts and concentration of suppliers. For example, because production is concentrated in a few countries, major crop losses in wheat, corn, rice, and soybeans caused by extreme weather and climate events can cause spikes in global food prices. On the demand side, Dependence on staples and the buffering capacity of local markets can shape vulnerability. However, unlike food staples, production of energy and mining supplies are more diversified. And at least according to the literature, disruptions in production would have more to do with resource availability, technology, political decisions, social license to operate those kinds of factors. Now, distributions to global food production and related global price effects can show up in local prices here too. And if you looked at the assessment chapter, it includes a text box on food price spikes in 2007, 2008, and then again, 2010, 2011. And really tries to tell a story of how severe weather events and non-climate or non-weather factors contributed to drive these global price spikes and how the ripple effects were felt in Canada. Now, there are a few studies that model the future impacts of climate change on trade, say to 20, the 2050s or 2080s. They have inconsistent methods, use different scenarios, have different assumptions or representation of global regions that makes comparing across um, studies difficult. Studies show that Canada is among the few global regions with the potential to experience positive GDP impacts and a rise in exports by mid-century from climate-induced changes across multiple sectors. But hopefully, as is noted in the chapter, you get that sense, there's very little confidence in these numerical estimates 
Um, so I'm only going to be referring to some maybe qualitative messages in this presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, so that was a lot of talking about climate change impacts. What about adaptation? Uh, well, there is a little there is little evidence to draw from to assess the readiness by Canadian industry or economic sectors to manage trade related climate change impacts with most attention on the climate side focused on the role of trade in the context of the low carbon transition and some evidence of an implementation gap where say a port operator will assess climate change risk, but will take a wait and see approach to adaptation. Perhaps in the Q and A session, others um, have comments or evidence um, to bring to the table that presents a more hopeful picture. And I would be happy to hear that. Uh, as Fiona and others at Enercan remind us, adaptation also involves taking advantage of potential opportunities presented by climate change. And indeed, there is an emerging market for climate resilience and adaptation goods and services. That box, little box on the right hand of the slide tells a little story about what those opportunities could look like. There is very, fairly little analysis on what the, what the size of the opportunity could be, which sectors would be most advantageous to, for Canada to promote, et cetera, but there's an emerging interest in that area. And finally, before I turn it over to Robert, one could say that short and long-term adjustments in trade in response to climate variation is market-based adaptation or autonomous adaptation. And by extension, enhancing trade activity could play a role in moderating, moderating the future impacts of climate change transmitted through trade networks and prices. Adjustments can include diversify, diversifying suppliers, shifting production to areas with a comparative advantage of climate resilience to offset shortfalls in production in climate-affected areas. And in the case of the food system, building grower sector capacity to manage climate change risk, which would be essential in reducing losses or preventing losses. Specifically in the area of global food trade, however, studies suggest that wealthier countries like Canada are more likely to capture gains from the adaptive effect of trade than our regions in the global south. And that is a logical seg segue to hand it over to Robert. Okay, thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'll pick up on key message four then, uh, which is an area where I've done a lot of research myself uh, over the years, which is on the links between climate change and uh, migration and displacement and what that means for Canada. Now, I do use the terms uh, migration and displacement deliberately because migration implies that the person who's moving has a choice in the matter, whereas displacement is a, a case where the person has little or no choice but to move. So if you think about, for example, the folks out in British Columbia uh, this past year in 2021 who lost their homes because of fires or, or floods and had to move, those are displaced people. Migration is more a case where someone makes a conscious choice to move. Uh, and so when we look at the global picture, we know what the key drivers are of uh, migration and particularly of, of involuntary displacement of people around the world. Uh, the big ones are hurricanes and other extreme storm events and floods. Those are the two big ones in particular worldwide, um, followed by droughts, wildfires, extreme heat events, and other sorts of climate hazards as well. Uh, and so there's a, a, an organization called the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center in Geneva that uh, collects annual statistics from around the world on these, um, on these sorts of events. Uh, and in 2021, what they found was that about 30 million people worldwide were displaced uh, from their homes by weather or climate related uh, disasters. Uh, and they're found in, in many parts of the world. Um, the, the big uh, areas for climate related displacements are areas where flooding and, uh, and hurricanes and cyclones are common. So for example, in Southeast Asia, uh, South Asia, so talking about uh, India, Bangladesh, Pakistan has a lot of flood hazards as well, but moving eastward through Asia, uh, looking along the coast of uh, Vietnam, for example, the Philippines, um, southern China, and so on. Uh, but also in parts of our own hemisphere. So the United States is actually very prone to displacements related to floods and storms. In fact, large areas of the, uh, the Caribbean basin as well, going down into Central America and so on. And of course, the Southwestern United States very expo exposed to extreme heat 
um, and, uh, and wildfires as well. And um, these hazards are going to increase in coming decades uh, because of climate change. The, the frequency, the severity, and or the geographic location of these sorts of events is just going to expand. We also have another challenge in that population growth is very high in many of these regions. So for example, Sub-Saharan Africa has very high rates of population growth. You have parts of that region that are exposed to floods, others to droughts and so on. And same with coastal regions of South and Southeast Asia, uh, where there's large growing cities, especially uh, very close to sea level. And then of course, although the population numbers are relatively small uh, in small island developing states in the Pacific Ocean, in the Indian Ocean, parts of the Caribbean, uh, the absolute population numbers tend to be small, but the population growth rates are higher. And those countries in particular are extremely exposed to all of these risks, plus the additional risks associated with sea level rise over coming decades as well. And what does this all mean for Canada? Well, first of all, we will have our own experience here in Canada with people being displaced from their homes. Uh, and we have examples, again, from last summer from British Columbia, in previous years from Fort McMurray, uh, floods in Quebec in years before that, floods in Manitoba in years before that. So we'll have these events internally. But at the same time, if you think about immigration to Canada and where Canadians increasingly come from and where their family ties are, many of them come from regions where climate related disasters uh, are very common. And so if you look at um, you know, immigration to Canada, just in general terms, where people come from these days, uh, you'll see that the top five countries, uh, source countries of immigrants to Canada are countries like India, China, the Philippines, Pakistan, Nigeria is increasing. Uh, the United States is in there, uh, typically in the top five source countries, but uh, it, it's been a long time since the Americans have been within the top three source countries of permanent migration to Canada. And that makes Canada a little bit of an outlier in the global pattern, because at the global scale, most migration takes place within countries. And when it's international, it tends to be to neighboring countries within the same region. So people from Bangladesh moving to, to India, people from Cambodia moving to Vietnam and back and forth and so on. Canada, our big source countries for immigration are actually quite distant from our shores. So we're in a bit of a different situation from other countries, but what we will see almost certainly in coming decades is that um, as climate related disasters become more common and more frequent in other parts of the world, people in Canada who have family ties to those uh, countries will be seeking for the Canadian government to intervene and to act proactively in terms of both helping in disaster recovery, but also in helping relocate people to Canada uh, who have family ties here, who have been displaced by these sorts of climate events. So you can see there's almost a growth in demand for immigration to Canada from these climate uh, exposed parts of the world. And again, I mentioned, you know, Philippines, China, India being uh, routinely uh, countries where you get millions of people displaced each year by weather related disasters that are becoming more common. Uh, well, those countries are also already large source countries of, of ex existing migration flows to Canada. So we're going to see more demand along those lines. Um, and uh, one of the things you'll see in the little box here is a little case study that we did, which is the relationship between climate, uh, migration, displacement, and conflict. And so in West Africa, for example, there's a country called Mali, which has had a lot of uh, internal uh, political instability and conflict. Uh, there's been a lot of movement of Malians in and out of the country, often related to droughts uh, and, uh, and other uh, climate-related factors. Uh, and as a result of this, uh, Canadian peacekeepers uh, three years ago were actually sent to uh, Mali to help stabilize as part of a larger UN mission. Uh, Canada has ceased its participation officially in the mission, but even today, I think there's about 15 or 20 Canadian personnel there that are still on the ground there. And this is one of these events where climate change helps to further disrupt an already unstable situation. So the, the, the distress migration we see in Mali, which contributes to the political instability, um, is climate influenced. And now Canadian uh, peacekeepers and, and uh, personnel are going in to try and stabilize something where the root causes uh, are linked to climate instability. Next slide, please. <clears throat> 
Yes, so um, in terms of um, what we can expect uh, or what we can do about it, I should say, in the future, there's a few things we can do. One is, I mean, the root cause of all of this is our continually high rates of greenhouse gas emissions in Canada and in other industrialized countries around the world. So when policymakers ask me, how can we prevent or reduce the risk of large scale uh, climate related displacements in the future? Uh, you know, address the root cause, which is uh, address the root causes of climate change, and you avoid a lot of those risks. And I've been actively involved in some of these studies for international organizations, looking at different scenarios for climate change and the number of people who will be uh, displaced by them. One of these studies was done by the World Bank, uh, and it, the first version of it was released uh, three years ago, the second version last year. And essentially what they say is this, is that if we do nothing about our greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and we do nothing to help low-income countries in the global south uh, advance in terms of sustainable development, then by 2050, which isn't that far off into the future, uh, we can expect anywhere up to 140, 150 million people around the world displaced from their homes because of climate related events and conditions. A lot of those people within our own hemisphere, in Central America, in the Caribbean and so on. So obviously um, there is this risk, but at the same time, the same study says that if we, uh, if we cut our greenhouse gas emissions and abide by the Paris Agreement, and if we help low income countries uh, reach their sustainable development goals, we can reduce or indeed uh, eliminate any increase in uh, people being displaced by climate related re reasons in coming decades. So there is an opportunity to address the root causes and shrink the risk of people being displaced around the world. And that, that, that focus on sustainable development is very important in a global context because countries that are socially and economically advanced and have good uh, social supports and social networks for their citizens are better able to cope with uh, the, the extreme events that happen because of climate change. Just take British Columbia as an example uh, this past summer. Uh, there's tremendous human costs and people are still out of their homes and the damages have been enormous in financial terms and there's still a lot of rebuilding to be done. But there was a relatively small loss of life compared to the same events happening in other countries where you get huge loss of life, huge loss of, of housing, huge damage to livelihoods. And it takes years and years for countries to recover from that because they're not as economically well off as Canadians. So that's where we need to be helping other countries as well. And again, by meeting these goals that we've already committed to, the government of Canada has already said it's going to work towards these, we can help reduce these large scale human displacements in coming decades. Next slide, please. And this transitions into another section of our chapter, which looks at this link between climate change, Canada's interests, and international development assistance. Um, and so what we've tried to, to illustrate very briefly here and in greater detail in the chapter is that climate change can undermine uh, political uh, stability and general human well-being and security, especially in low and middle income countries. And so it's in Canada's interest to be actively engaged in helping build sustainable development. And this can be done in through, it, through means of financial transfers. It can be technical assistance. There's a variety of ways in which Canadian innovations and development can help low and middle income countries and other parts of the world to make them more climate uh, resilient. And again, it's in our self-interest, right? Peacekeeping missions are, are very expensive and they're very dangerous, obviously, for Canadian uh, personnel who get involved in them. And they're sort of a last resort mechanism. The first, the first opportunity for us is to get involved in sort of traditional on the ground development assistance to make uh, low income countries more economically self sufficient and to tamper down the risks of internal conflict and instability and so on. And this is where Canada, again, as one of these countries that has a reputation for being an honest broker and being a peacekeeping nation, we have an opportunity to help other countries where it's even in our self interest. Uh, again, we've got a little box on the side, and this is a case study that we looked at. There's been a lot of talk about the Syrian conflict in recent years, and you'll recall that Canada. Uh, was part of the international effort to resettle people who were displaced because of that civil conflict. And there's queer concerns about whether uh, climate events like drought and extreme heat helped uh, cause that conflict. And what we've seen is that uh, the drought itself was 
probably not the immediate and direct cause of the Syrian conflict. There was lots of political and economic and other instability in Syria long before the drought came along uh, in the 2010-2012 period, uh, but it probably added fuel to the fire. In other words, it displaced people from their homes, rural people lost their livelihoods, and it, it added greater stress to an already stressful situation that, as we know, eventually blew up into armed conflict as well. So the key message here is that climate change alone is probably not going to cause countries to attack and invade one another. Could, but what it could do is to, uh, to add fuel to existing fires. Next slide, please. And so um, one of the things that Canada needs to think about here is how can we improve and increase and, and mainstream climate change into our existing development commitments uh, and to, uh, and to uh, add more uh, commitments to what we're already doing. And so um, one of the things that came out of this since our report was published is that Canada was at the uh, COP26 climate agreement in Glasgow. And so a, a number of new commitments have been made, not just by Canada, but by other countries in terms of making assistance available uh, to low-income countries uh, to help uh, to help these countries build up their green infrastructure to make themselves more climate resilient. So that's a very positive development on the policy front, and obviously the hope is that we follow through on things like that. One of the areas where Canada needs to pull up its socks a little bit, uh, and, and this is recognized, is that our spending on development assistance in general, uh, and specifically on climate change, has tended to lag behind other high-income countries uh, in Europe uh, and elsewhere in the world. And so really we do need to think about more development spending, not just simply because it's the right thing to do, but also again, because there's a payback to us in terms of living in a less climate disrupted world. And again, if you look at the box on the right-hand side, if you look at some of the key countries that are already important targets of Canadian development assistance, you'll see that Haiti, Mali, South Sudan, and so on, these are countries that are extremely climate vulnerable very, very much at risk of extreme weather events, of storms, of heat, and so on. So again, this mainstreaming of climate change into our development programming is super important in coming decades, in coming years, too. Uh, I think that's my next slide. Do we uh, want to advance to the next one, please? So I'm going to turn back to uh, Jimena at this point, if we could, please. Thanks, Robert. Um, right, so we are at the end of our, the second part of our presentation, and we're going to end off with a couple of slides on emerging issues and knowledge gaps. Um, so as you might have uh, intuited from our presentation, uh, where the focus is really was really on talking about climate change risks and understanding kind of mechanisms through which climate change risks can manifest, as well as kind of underlying conditions that might not have to do with climate change, with less discussion on adaptation and kind of how Canada's positioned to adapt. And what I can say about that is that adaptation in these contexts, so the, the themes that we're talking about, is either not documented or not yet happening on a consistent basis. And again, you know, we have a fairly large audience today, and I would love to hear um, good examples of, of uh, adaptation taking place in those spheres, spheres that we met, we talked about. Uh, I would say too that um, research on the risks and opportunities to Canada from international dimensions of climate change remains underdeveloped. So there's a good opportunity for scholars and practitioners to publish, and really it is a call to action um, for those in um, academic communities and communities of practice who are doing a lot of good work on the ground and uh, in collaboration with um, universities and other research partners to publish, publish, publish. It's the only way that um, that understanding of how adaptation and climate change risk in international dimensions is evolving. The only way to bring it into the assessment uh, is really to, ha to have it published and make it accessible. Um, one of the, <laughs> I'll share with you something about the review period. Uh, one of the comments I got from a reviewer when we were going through the peer review process is, um, 
something along the lines of, whoa, yeah, you t- there's a lot of uncertainty. I get it. There's a lot of unknowns. I get it. But can you say something to help elucidate or help provide some guidance for decision makers? <laughs> and fair enough. Um, there are definitely some early indicators of risk factors um, that decision makers can look to um, in while knowledge gaps are being filled and kind of the scholarship and knowledge bases is, is being addressed. Um, so this is what we try to uh, pull together, aggregate, um, synthesize in our last section, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, so what you're seeing on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, and it appears um, in the assessment chapter itself, is uh, the, author t- the author team's qualitative assessment of risk and opportunities to climate change from cross-border impacts over the next 30 years. And what we what we did was pull out um, risk statements or what you know we could construct as risk statements throughout the chapter and gave our assessment of the likelihood of these happening and how confident we were in those how confident we were in those risk statements using a five point and a four, four point scale. Um, and this is just one excerpt from. Uh, that qualitative assessment that we did. You can look at the full list in in the chapter itself. One of the um, stepping back from kind of this um, qualitative qualitative assessment that we did, one of the key messages here for us is really we have least confidence in risk factors related to international trade. Um, And so uh, this is an area I think that really requires further discussion, deliberation, analysis. Next slide, please. Right. So though that was a little bit on knowledge gaps. So this, this is a bit on emerging issues. Um, we were, as, as part of the assessment process, uh, we were asked to uh, kind, of, kind of end the chapter on, to pull out emerging issues that uh, could um, point us in a direction uh, to guide new research and new assessment work, et cetera, for future iterations of, um, of this work. And these are the four that, uh, that we thought appropriate to highlight. Um, as Robert alluded to, um, there is an important uh, strategy to integrate considerations of climate change risk and adaptation into the different policy domains and kind of response areas that we are, we are talking about today. And this all um, relates to how uh, adaptation governance. And so all of these thematic areas that we've talked to, we've talked about today, uh, whether it's international trade or um, immigration, humanitarian response, disaster assistance, they exist within their own institutional and policy frameworks, their own kind of rules of engagement and cultural norms, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, now we have to kind of embed considerations of climate change risks and, and adaptation within these ongoing, within these existing um, policy um, frameworks and institutional frameworks. And uh, some of them will require reforming um, or adjusting pretty radically in light of climate change risk, such as you know we're suggesting in the section on transboundary resource sharing. There might be institutions that, uh, actually don't exist, that there's some sort of policy or institutional gap um, that needs to be addressed. Uh, So there are a number of governance issues that come to light when uh, when assessing such complex issues as these international dimensions of climate change impacts and adaptation. And then finally, in the context of kind of uh, how Canada presents itself internationally or contributes to the global public good, um, we can't, uh, uh, we have to bring up the fact of, you know, there's an evolving public political sentiment about it domestically about Canada's role in the world. And so, you know, this set sentiment kind of evolves over time, kind of waxes and wanes about our, our role and relative contributions, but it's something that's important to consider in terms of kind of the, the size and nature of our response and engagement internationally. Uh, just quickly, because we're running out of time here, but moving on to the next point, um, a lot of the literature that I saw um, 
that I reviewed when preparing the trade uh, section um, was on global food systems. So the, the effects of uh, climate change on agriculture and food and kind of how those risks are transmitted through trade networks and, um, and a lot of the what the implications could be for food security, um, et cetera, et cetera. And these are very, you know, quite complex issues. And there's a um, lots of different schools of thought about whether to increase reliance on international trade to kind of boost resili resilience to climate shocks or whether to really um, invest more in building and localizing food systems and building greater reliance on kind of local, regional, uh, national kind of food um, system sovereignty. In any case, the point is that uh, this is an emerging area, I think, that really uh, could could benefit from further uh, research and analysis to understand Canada's role in supporting food security and climate resilience in food systems within Canada, outside of Canada, more broadly, uh, and specifically threat to food supplies in Canada, since we rely quite heavily on imported food, imported foods um, as well. Uh, the next two points are are a bit more technical, um, but uh, so still important. Um, clearly, analyzing, assessing uh, the international dimensions of climate change and how you know the through the different transmission mechanisms and taking into account non climate stressors and how things might happen at the same time in different countries and the ripple effects of that. There's a lot of complexity and it just, you know, it's it's complex to do that domestically or within a sector, within a region, within communities. Um, it just, the complexity really blows up when you talk about international dimensions. Um, but there are tools that can help us a deal or kind of bound um, uncertainty and complexity and tools that help us bring together um, climate and non-climate stressors, ass assessing, assessing them together in a cohesive framework like cumulative effects assessment, for example. There's foresight tools, scenario planning, um, you know, uh, uh, the, these kinds of things that horizon scanning, these kinds of techniques that can can really help not predict what can happen in the future with any certainty, um, but at least get us thinking about what futures might be possible and therefore what responses and what robust responses are maybe required. And of course, Besides the tools, so having the tools is important, the tools and methods, that's important, but really making sure that decision makers are competent in the use of these tools is equally important. And then finally, uh, just to point on economic modeling and our colleague, um, uh, our, uh, our colleague Richard Boyd will talk quite a, a lot about this, I think in the, a future webinar on the cost of benefits um, of adaptation. Um, there's still quite a high demand to see numbers, to see dollar signs. Um, you know, uh, economic evidence and information is is compelling uh, uh, to make a business case to act or to kind of raise the attention of, of some of these issues. And so um, in international studies, you know, Canada, as I mentioned in my presentation, often comes out as kind of a net beneficiary of, of, of climate change due to you know, lengthen growing seasons and all the tourists that are going to come to Canada, um, you know, as climate become unsuitable elsewhere in the world. But, um, you know, pretty crude assumptions are made. And so there, there is scope for really improving um, Canada's representation in global models, as well as doing our own homework and doing our own economic modeling on climate sensitive trade sectors. And then understanding, for example, how impacts of climate change in US sectors can affect us given the strong trade ties we have with the US, as well as with China and you know the other trade partners that I mentioned um, in one of my interest slides. And with that, con that concludes Concludes our presentation. Happy to answer, uh, try to answer a few questions in the remaining time that we have. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much, Mena, and thank you, Robert. We have about uh, about fifteen minutes left for questions. Uh, thank you to everyone who 
who has posted some in the box, continue to do so. Uh, because we have quite a few already, I'm going to jump right in. I'm going to start with a question for uh, Jimena, for one of our participants, and it's about climate disclosure. Is there hope that large companies such as trade companies and shipping companies will eventually need to disclose climate risks, similar to what is done, I suppose, in the US and UK? And if so, would this help our understanding of international climate impacts? I, I can answer that. Um, so the short answer is yes. Uh, increasing climate risk disclosure um, among large public list listed companies and other uh, companies with that have a strong role in um, delivering critical infrastructure services, for example, is would be super important to understand um, the level of risk, climate risk that they're facing, and what types of management actions they're taking to address identified risks. Um, I know one of the chapters in the assessment focuses on financial climate risk disclosure. And uh, I haven't read it in a long time, but I'm sure you can take a look at that, at that chapter and might have some more detailed information about that. What I found personally when looking at the literature for this um, trade section, and this, you know, it took a while to put together this assessment chapter. So, and this is a really dynamic evolving field. So it's really hard to stay up to date with the literature. What I found though, is that in disclosures, um, companies and kind of other large entities still really focus on um, like the low carbon transition risk and kind of risks related to greenhouse gas um, emissions uh, reductions and kind of climate uh, carbon pricing policy and things like that. Um, th there is an increasing kind of practice or um, awareness of the importance of physical risk disclosure, which is kind of where um, climate change assessment of climate change impacts and kind of adaptation related stuff would come in. Um, that was my observation then, but uh, hopefully things things have improved. Great, thanks, Amanda. And uh, we can also post the link to the climate litigation disclosure and finance chapter in the chat box. I was interested. So the next question I'm going to pass to uh, Robert. You can see it here. So the participant writes, the tone around migration and migrants is currently quite skewed. For example, it's acceptable for people moving out of the BC interior due to fire seasons and smoke, but for people moving due to poor economic opportunities in their country because of climate change, in that case, is not deemed as favorable. So when we speak about climate change and migration, should we be changing how we talk about borders and immigration? That's a great question. And uh, let me start by saying I'm a little bit biased in answering it. Uh, my wife is an immigrant and my mother is an immigrant. So you can sort of see where I stand uh, personally on the topic of immigration and how to frame it. Um, but in terms of the research that was done for this report, and then just the, the general um, literature research uh, studies on this, you're absolutely right. There's this tendency in the media and even in political debates and discussions to frame migration in the context of climate change as something to fear or something to worry about. That you know, there's going to be these floods of climate refugees pouring across international borders and so on, uh, and it's a very um, you know, it's, it's a very negative narrative as, as climate is a threat. And there are examples of countries uh, in different parts of the world when you talk about climate adaptation, what that means in that country is to try and keep people from migrating from the countryside to the city. How can we keep folks where they are and keep them to get them to stay put? Um, and then if you think about in Europe and in the United States uh, lately as well, Migration, migrants are, 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 you know, described in very negative terms and as, again, as people that we should uh, try to keep out. Um, and there's very good uh, evidence, uh, empirical evidence to show that migration is not the problem. The problem is the circumstances under which migration occurs. If you force people into illegal activities, if you force them to migrate clandestinely, um, what you do is you reward organized crime. That's what happens. You reward traffickers and smugglers and you create misery for the migrants, for the source communities and their families at home. And the, the migrants themselves have trouble integrating and, and uh, incorporating into the communities where they arrive. And so the literature shows very clearly that 
one of the ways that we uh, should be thinking about migration in a climate disrupted future is how can we uh, provide regular, ordinary people opportunities to move legally within their countries or across international borders to gain access to jobs and, and other labor market opportunities and so on. And if, you, if we can do that, then we can actually make migration part of the larger strategy to adaptation, to successful adaptation to the risks of these extreme climate events that are coming, whether we like it or not. And so, yes, the way we talk about it, this is where Canada has the ability to sort of point to other countries and say, hey, look, here's how we deal with immigration in Canada. We have a system where we, it's not the greatest, it's not perfect, but we have regularized channels by which people can migrate to our country and can adjust and adapt to our labor markets. And it's been successful more often than it's not been successful. And so this is a message that Canada can take uh, to other countries as well. Uh, so Trevor, great question. Great answer, thanks Robert. Okay, so the next question will be for either of you. Um, I'll start, to, this is fairly general. Apart from migration patterns, how might the impacts and adaptation issues presented here today differ across other Arctic states? Or are they fairly consistent across northern states? Uh, Robert, I think you're probably better positioned to answer that um, given your IPCC work. Okay, I'll, I, I, I do defer to you on these things, Amina. So I put a little brief answer in the chat room to the question at first glance. So in our chapter, we focus pretty heavily on Arctic sovereignty, Ar Arctic sovereignty and Arctic shipping in particular, uh, but as other issues as well. Um, and so, yeah, I put in, in my answer to the chat, there's, there's few things that are shared across all Arctic nations, right? What are the impacts going to be on infrastructure of warming permafrost, for example, on communities and their, and their built infrastructure? What will be the impacts of changes in sea levels for coastal infrastructure, for our port facilities, for access to shipping routes and fishing routes and, and things like that. And of course, we're all concerned about the impacts on indigenous communities and indigenous livelihoods, which are already in the Canadian context, having to adjust and adapt to a changing climate. Uh, but there are some distinct differences uh, as well. Uh, you know, in the case of sovereignty and economic development in the Arctic, the, the Russian government is, you know, full steam ahead. How can we, uh, I, I was actually in a CBC uh, studio where uh, the Russian ambassador to Canada was being interviewed about Arctic uh, climate change and shipping. And his answer was essentially, yes, this is fantastic. Bring it on as quickly as we can. You know, look at all the economic development opportunities for Russia. So there's a very different approach, I think, in a Canadian context, which is a much more uh, a, a much more different approach to the risks as well as the potential economic opportunities associated with Arctic climate change. And, and in this report, we look at, okay, if shipping is going to increase in the Arctic and through the Northwest Passage through Canadian territorial waters, what does that imply? How do we adapt to this changing Arctic environment? So I don't know if you wanted to pick up or add anything more to that, Jimena, but that's sort of the focus that we have uh, in our chapter, I believe. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Robert. Um, yeah, just uh, thinking about like, I was so pretty focused on understanding what Canada implications for Canada might be not comparing it with Arctic states outside of that, the section on um, Arctic shipping, but um, other northern states in trade, I, uh, other Arctic states don't get well represent other than Russia, I think don't get don't get well represented in global like re, as regional modules and global models. So there wouldn't have there wouldn't be results that are specific to them. Uh, yeah, so nothing more to contribute to that answer. Thanks. Um, next question. Um... About COVID. So where do you see the current COVID situation actually helping us understand the complex impacts of climate change? For example, the impacts of COVID on supply chains, then on inflation, then on the economy as a whole. Robert? 
Sure, I'll, I'll jump in on that and then turn over to Jimena. So yeah, I mean, it's a case study, isn't it, COVID? It, a real life, real time case study of, of how this uh, rapidly unfolding extreme event that we really were not prepared for, how it causes huge disruptions to our basic systems, to our healthcare system, obviously first and foremost, but to our economic systems, uh, to our transportation systems, and our social well-being as well. Um, so yeah, the, the disruptions that we all face right now uh, in terms of you know going to the grocery store and finding that a shelf is bare, or a contractor who is trying to source you know a particular type of paint or uh, particular materials for a building project and is finding simply that either they're not accessible or available or um, are at a inflated costs and and so on. And when you think about it, this is minor compared to the scale of the disruption that we lock ourselves into if we continue down the path of high greenhouse gas emissions, you know, the disruptions that we will cause to global economic supply chains and industry and health and well-being uh, if we lock ourselves into a high emissions future, um, you know, it, it only magnifies in coming decades. And so this is kind of like a test run for it. It also uh, shows the impacts of what we call cascading risks or compound risks. Think about, for example, the disruptions that were caused this past year in British Columbia because of the floods because of the fires. And on top of that, the public health challenges associated with, uh, with COVID as well. And this is one of the things that researchers are increasingly worried about is that, you know, we sort of think about disasters in isolation. Oh, there was an ice storm. Oh, there was a flood. Oh, there was a fire. But they're, they're thought of as discrete events that we manage and respond to. But when they start to co-occur, then we magnify the challenges as well. So this is why the focus on our report, I think, is so heavily on adaptation now, building resilience now, because, you know, managing these risks flying by the seat of our pants, that is not going to work in 20 years. It simply is not. And COVID just magnifies that. Humana, did you want to pick up on that? Yeah, thanks. Uh, and that's a that's a great question. I did raise that in the context of kind of understanding supply weather related supply chain disruptions, and I think people are, uh, when you say things like that, people are much more likely to get what what that means nowadays. Like su supply chains, I think wasn't even in the kind of normal like regular vernacular of people um, vocabulary, but now now it is for sure. Um, I was gonna just say a couple of comments on more kind of the social dimensions. Um, uh, so when COVID initially hit, we thought it was going to be like a big shock. And two years in, it's more like a sustained stressor that has eroded, degraded our mental health, um, some social connections. And um, I was just reflecting on that the other day about how, yeah, initially we thought, okay, well, the pandemic is a great opportunity, like, a great opportunity is an opportunity to show like how climate shocks can affect all of these systems that we rely on and it is as as robert has just highlighted but it it is now turning into an opportunity opportunity quote unquote to highlight how kind of gradual sustained changes disruptions to our daily lives can affect kind of our well-being as well unfortunately um, and then the other thing relates to kind of the ways we ways of working. Um, and I think Alain, it was you who asked the question and we've talked about this briefly before, but uh, with COVID, I was really surprised. I, I, I work with a number of federal government departments and other kind of large organizations about how quickly they were able to um, kind of adjust the ways that they worked and um, did things much more quickly and in much more agile fashion than they thought you know, than they thought they would be able to because there was such an imminent need um, to make those quick adjustments and people were making quick decisions that maybe in other cases wouldn't been as comfortable to make, but there was like a, a great urgency to do that. And, and as well in, in, the, in the work that I do um, internationally, uh, it has this COVID, this COVID um, pandemic and kind of, you know, the after effects of that have really demonstrated that it, it traveling is not as necessary as we thought it was. It really isn't. And they're really, I mean, face-to-face -face 
nothing beats face-to-face -face communications in some cases, but in other cases, it really is not necessary. And so we can cut down our, our carbon emissions. We can work with partners who are, you know, have a visible presence in the countries where we work. Um, and uh, yeah, it's not necessarily more cost effective, but, uh, but all that travel is, is not that necessary. So it's actually changing the way we work, which will be helpful for climate change adaptation as well. Great. Well, yes, excellent, excellent answers. I think we could talk about this for a long time, but I think we've reached the end for one minute over our webinar. So I'm just going to ask uh, Deep Brooke to bring up the closing slide. So a big thank you again to Robert and Jimena. Excellent presentation, excellent discussion. Thank you too to everyone who joined us today. Uh, for many of you for taking your lunch hours, let's spend it with us. I just want to remind you that there's two more webinars left in our series. Next Friday, it's the Water Resources and Ecosystem Services chapter that we'll be discussing. And then the week after, I believe, you have the 18th, it'll be the webinar on the costs and benefits chapter. So we hope you can join us for these sessions. And uh, thank you for joining us today. And I wish everyone a very wonderful weekend. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate your attention.